Hey there, you are listening to the Going Scared Podcast, and this is your host, Jessica Honiger, founder of the social impact fashion brand, Noon Day Collection. Well, today we are beginning a new series, and you're not going to believe this, but we've been planning it for a while, and it's all about resilience. So much of the Going Scared Podcast is about the process of being brave. It's about naming our fears and moving forward anyway. But the very process of being brave involves falling down, oftentimes a lot. Resilience is the process of getting back up again after the fall. Resilience is defined as the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. And aren't we in a difficulty right now? Last year, I faced a few falls. Noonday, the company that I run, didn't meet its sales goals. A dear friend and colleague lost her mom to a horrific and slow death caused by paralysis. We were remodeling and weren't living in our home. And other falls that you heard about throughout 2019 on this podcast, because if there's one thing I do well, it's being vulnerable with you guys. As I was facing these difficulties, it felt as if my expectations had been drawn in permanent marker. And when I didn't get what I wanted, my ego had an all out temper tantrum. And yeah, the circumstances were challenging and hard, but it was my acute awareness at how I was responding to those circumstances that sent me on a new unlearning and then relearning journey. I needed to learn resilience. This new podcast series is an invitation for us to learn how we can navigate the hardship and hurt that comes alongside the choice to be brave and vulnerable. So when we planned this series, I seriously wondered how on earth I was going to get you to listen to a podcast series about people who have been through tremendous suffering. I mean, let's face it, we often treat suffering with the phrase on the inside, I hope, only saying, gosh, I'm glad that's not me. Well, now we find ourselves in the middle of a global pandemic and there really is no me versus them. There's only an us right now. This really is the series that we need right now. Our first teacher is Dr. Edith Eager. I read her book titled The Choice last year, and it profoundly impacted me. I've shared about it multiple times on Instagram. And when I shared about it, I never in my dreams imagined that I would actually have the honor to speak with her. Dr. Edith Eager was 16 when her Hungarian Jewish family was sent to the Auschwitz concentration camp. There, she lost her parents and fought for her life, just barely surviving and withstanding unspeakable tragedy. And it was there that she faced a choice. And at age 90, she writes about that choice. Today, she is a psychologist and an inspirational speaker who's been interviewed by the likes of Oprah, She speaks to those who have experienced physical and mental trauma, and today she speaks to us right in the middle of our own global tragedy. We have much to learn from her. Oh my goodness, I am so honored to talk with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I'm deeply grateful. I'll be honest, I've been a little nervous because you are a hero in my eyes. <laughs> so, Thank you. but um, just your book really came into my life at a really needed time. I only read it a few months ago, and your story and your ability to be resilient around your mindset. Um, has just really impacted my life. So thank you for writing it. Thank you for having an experience with Edie. Yes, yes. And you're a fellow Texan. I live in Austin and my grandmother actually grew up on the border. So I have 
a passion for everything that's gone on along the border. And I just wanted to thank you, too, for standing up for the victims that um, are on the border right now. I, uh, I, I really had tremendous uh, nightmare seeing what's happening on the border. So you never get over it. Mm. So your book, The Choice, Embrace the Possible, you mm. wrote it when you were 90, which I was so surprised. I didn't know that when I actually was reading the book. I would have thought, oh my goodness, you would have written this so much sooner in life. So I'm curious what prompted you in your, I imagine you wrote this in your late 80s, to write and put your story to paper? Well, many, many years people asked me to write a book, and I would say I have nothing to say, nothing to say. But then Philip Zimbardo told me that the survivors who are famous are all men, and they, mm. and they needed a female voice. And he pushed me, pushed me until I realized that I have a lot to say. <laughs> a lot to it. say. But it took a <laughs> lifetime for me to write that. I was surprised also as I was reading your story that you you didn't talk about your story for no. about 20 years. And exactly. exactly. You, I, I am part of what is called the conspiracy of silence. Uh, people who just, I didn't know how to let you know where I was because... I didn't want you to feel sorry for me. Mm. So I went underground, but now I realize that it just goes under. <laughs> it doesn't go away. And I had to learn how to make peace with that and uh, able to live a full life in the present. Mm. I love w what you say when you're revisiting Auschwitz for the first time. And you say that you deny what hurts, what you fear, you avoid it at all costs. Then you find a way to welcome and embrace what you're most afraid of, and then you can finally let it go. Were there even new layers of healing for you as you wrote this book? Because you, you know, you became a therapist, you've done a ton of therapy yourself, but even as you were writing this book, were there new parts of your story you began to own as you shared them? I am. Uh never get over what happened. I don't really ever will forget what happened. I came to terms with it because I don't live in Auschwitz. I live in a present. And so I think it's very important to really acknowledge that if you're still living in a past and you're still holding on to anger, you're still a prisoner. Mm. So I think it was important for me to go back to Auschwitz, reclaim my innocence, assign the shame and guilt to the perpetrator, and begin to forgive myself that I survived. Mm. I had tremendous survivor's guilt. Wow. So when I, when I graduated, I never showed up for my graduation because I, I said to myself, I'm here and they are dead. And I uh, didn't even give myself the opportunity to be really happy and proud that I graduated with honors. Wow. Tell us the journey of what prompted you to begin to come out of that conspiracy of silence. When I read Man's Search for Meaning, I wanted to write every page, 10 more pages. I don't know if you ever had such an experience. And I wrote an article called Victor Frankl and Me, and I got a letter from Victor Frankl, and I became a diplomat in logotherapy. And I did uh, his 90, 90th birthday. I gave the keynote address at the conference. Mm -hmm. So I became, I became really um, very devoted to Victor Frankl, but. He was 38 in Auschwitz. He was an MD and I was a 16-year-old in love. So we had different parts of our lives with different part of mentality too. But we all knew what to do and not allow the guards to take away 
our ability to find hope in hopelessness. I wanted you to get to share more about your your past and your childhood. But before we talk about that, I am curious a little bit about the life you live today, because you I know you stay really, really busy. So you still travel and speak. And are you still practicing as a therapist? Yes, I sure do. I have a patient coming in from Los Angeles in a few minutes to see me for a couple hours. I don't believe in retirement. <laughs> Well, I think the world needs you, so I hope. I will retire retirement. <laughs> How old are you? I am 43. There you go. <laughs> You're just beginning. Oh, that's... Just beginning to have your midlife transition, not crisis, transition. <laughs> this is true. This is true. I have to say I'm loving my 40s much more compared to my 30s and definitely my 20s. So you write in the introductory chapter of your book that um, my own search for freedom and my years of experience as a licensed clinical psychologist have taught me that suffering is universal, but victimhood yes. is optional. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? I think it's really a choice for us to be able to have a special place in our hearts I like to refer it to it as uh, as my cherished wound mm. that uh, that I'm able to become stronger since I have gone through that experience. I'm far more compassionate. I don't judge people, and I keep telling everyone that there is a Hitler in every one of us. And uh, unfortunately, we have genocide even as we speak. And um, I do everything in my power to see to it that that will never, ever happen again. I imagine that there are many Auschwitz survivors, um, people that you even maybe slept by, and they came out cynical and victimized and angry and maybe never experienced some of the own healing that you experienced what do you think are... I think it's very important. Yes. You have to acknowledge that you cannot give what you don't have, that self-love is self-care. And the journey that I take with my patients is uh, grieving and feeling because you can't heal what you don't feel and then healing. So it is, mm -hmm. it is a journey. I just came from Flagstaff. Arizona, and I saw the mountains, snow on the mountains, and I said, life is about climbing the mountain. You sleep and you climb, and you sleep and you climb, and but you never stop climbing. Mm. So I'm still in the process of becoming. I have yet to arrive. Wow. It's very encouraging to hear. I live in a present. I live in a present because I can only touch you now. And I think young, mm. not young and foolish, but hopefully to be not smart, but to be wise at 92. <laughs> so yeah. I am very grateful for my age and uh, <laughs> where I am still climbing. And I use my curiosity to look at things from many, many per perspectives. I want to hear a little bit about your mother. Um, she was such a huge influence on your life. And she said some profound words to you after the Nazis came and took your family. Can you tell us about her words and how those continue to be words that you've hung on to even until today? My mother was very, very sensitive. And I like to use the word melancholy because her mother died when she was nine years old. And uh, she had a picture of her mother above the piano, and she would talk to her mother every day. And uh, I never saw my mother really laughing from the belly. And I babysat my mom because my father played billiards, and he went with his cronies, and I spent the time with your mom with my mom and that's why i ask people when did your childhood end and uh, i babysat with my mom who was very much of an intellectual and 
she talked to me about going with the wind and and <laughs> I was always dreaming about uh, coming to America and uh, and uh, experiencing where the going with the wind was made so I had uh, quite a bit of colorful childhood taking care of my mom and learning so much at an early age. My in the cuddle card told me, which I always say to the students, I love to go to young people, that my mom told me, we don't know where we're going, we don't know what's going to happen, but just remember, no one can take away from you what you put in your mind. And that's exactly what happened. I lost everything. But I had my mind and I had my sister Magda that required a lot of, lot of help because she suffered much more from hunger than I did. So I ate my soup the night before and then I saved my bread and uh, shared it with my sister. Mm. So if you were only for the me, 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 you did not make it. We had to have mm. just even today that we're going to be much stronger with each other than me alone or you alone. I'm curious, when your mom said that to you, you were a young girl yourself. Did you fully grasp and understand? I was 16. You were 16. Did you fully grasp what she was saying to you at the time? I don't know whether I really truly had the maturity, but her voice was with me all the time that no one can take away from you anything and that uh, they can kill you, throw you in a gas chamber, but they could never murder my spirit. Mm. I know after you entered through the gates of Auschwitz um, and you watched your parents walk to their death, and then one of the first things they did was shave your heads, and there's this powerful moment that you have with your sister. Could you tell us about yes. that? Well, you know, Magda was the pretty one. My mother told me, I'm glad you have brains because you have no looks. So I, I became this, the good student, you know, and the learned one. But Magda, when we were shaved, looked at me and asked me, how do I look? And she had her hair in her palm. And then I realized that I had a choice then as you choice now, whether you pay attention to what you lost or or pay attention to what you still have with you. So instead of telling her how she really looked, I said to her, Magda, you have beautiful eyes. And I, I, I didn't see it because you had your hair all over the place. So this is something I like to bring the there and then to the here and now, because what happened to me is not that important. It was, was able to learn and discover that I had still a choice how to respond, but not how to react. Because if you mm. try to touch the guards, you were shot right away. If you touch the board wire, you were ele electrocuted. Mm. And I saw the blue bodies. So you see, we had to learn very quickly how to be able to somehow able to learn how to have the discomfort and to be able to not allow it to take over. That I still had a choice whether I will hate the guards or I would pray for them and change the hatred into pity. Mm -hmm. I felt sorry for the guard because I thought they were the prisoners, not me. So I, I created a world that they couldn't touch. I, I was really a very successful schizophrenic <laughs> because I knew, I knew the territory and what I had to be and do in order to make it. Mm. I remember I was 16 years old in love and my boyfriend told me I have beautiful eyes and beautiful hands. So I told everyone, tell me about my eyes, tell me about my hands, because I thought if I survive today, then tomorrow 
I'm going to see my boyfriend and show him my eyes and my hands. So the mm. future, the future became really something that's very important to mention that I was able to still think about that if I survive today, then tomorrow I'll be free. Mm. But you had to be very careful because I know that my friend from Yugoslavia told me that we're going to be liberated by Christmas. And then Christmas came and we were not liberated as she died the next day. Mm. So it was very important to be careful how we think. Tell us more about your liberation and how you were rescued. When I was in Oprah, on Oprah, um, she was a wonderful interviewer, of course. Uh, she's a beautiful woman who is giving away so much to educate people. In fact, she sent me a lovely, lovely woman who experienced uh, genocide in Ru Rwanda. Um, mm -hmm. So I told her that I was among the dead and then I felt someone holding my hand and I looked up and I saw big lips and then I saw, I saw tears in the eyes and M&Ms in the hand. It was a man of color. I wish I could meet him now mm. because it wouldn't have been long that I wouldn't be here today. But you know what was interesting? When we were liberated, people would walk through the gate and then they would come back and sit down. We were so brainwashed that we will never get out of here alive, mm -hmm. that, uh, that we didn't know what freedom meant. We were free, so know what? Freedom is very scary. And uh, many people would go through the gate and then come back. Right now, in particular, due to the coronavirus, there is a sense of fear among so many people and fear breeds scarcity. And I was thinking about you and how many times you chose instead of scarcity, you chose to believe in abundance, you chose sharing. And so I wanted you to speak to those people that have a sense of fear right now that might be leading them to a sense of scarcity. What advice, what help and can you give to them? I would say that not to give in to the fear because fear begets more fear. And anything you pay attention to, you're really uh, reinforcing that behavior. And fear will never, ever uh, go along with love. See, when we have fear, we have no love. When we have love, we have no fear. So I, I would say just to say that I'll do what's humanly possible, and then I hand it over to God. I cannot, I don't have any godly powers. I cannot stop anything. But I will be very, have, very, very careful not to go into big crowds, and, uh, and I do everything in my power to keep safe. But I, I would not give in to the fear at all because fear and love does not coexist. Mm, fear and love do not coexist. I'm thinking of the time in Auschwitz when yes. you say that um, a loaf of bread is what saved your life. And there were many times when you chose over and over again to share and to gift. Tell us about how that loaf of bread saved your life. Well, you know, there were times that I remember we didn't even get water, I mean, like for two weeks. And I'm here to tell you about it. I think we are much stronger than we think we are. And under certain circumstances, you just learn how to accept what you cannot change. Nothing came from the outside. I had to uh, be my own good encourager and say, I don't like it, it's inconvenient, and it's temporary, and I can survive it. N never say yes, but. Yes, and it's everything is temporary. And so I do with this moment what I can. And that's what keeps me young at 92. I live in the present, and I think young. You share about 
a time in a chapter titled A Cartwheel about... Yes, when my sister... Yes, can you share us about that? Well, we, we, we were going to go to the gas chamber, I was told, but then it was very chaotic and my sister ended up in one pile and I was in another pile and I knew that she had to be with me because she starved more, she suffered more from hunger than I did. So I started to do cartwheels to uh, to get the attention of the guard to look at me doing the cartwheel and she ran over to my place and we ended up actually on the top of a train and ended up in Auschwitz um, to to carry ammunition for the Nazis. So that's how I got out of Auschwitz in December 1944. And then I was uh, walking and they were bombing. Um, see, the British, they put us on the top of a train so the British wouldn't bomb seeing our striped uniforms, but they bombed anyway. And so I was so close to that many times. And uh, so it is, it is important for us, as I speak to you, get rid of guilt, honey, and get rid of worry. Guilt is in the past, worry is in the future. But if this happens, what if that happens? You see, what if the corona? I don't think that's really useful at all. Mm. Live in a present. If you're hungry, you eat. If you're thirsty, you drink. You know, that's the miracle in life, <laughs> that you're becoming a good mommy to you. Because mm. that's the only one you will have for a lifetime is you. All other relationships will end, I guarantee you. Mm. So dependency breeds depression. I'd love for us to close with this idea that, that you write about. You say that to survive is to transcend your own needs and commit yourself to someone or something outside of yourself. Yes, you know, they could have thrown me in a gas chamber any minute. Um, they told me I'm subhuman. They told me I'm never going to get out to feel alive. And um, see, uh, uh, but they could never murder my spirit. See, that's what I, even then I said to myself when they took my blood, very often I asked, you know, why are you taking my blood? And he said to aid the German soldiers <laughs> so we can win the war and take over the world. And I said to myself, you stupid idiot, with my blood you're never going to win the war. So I, I had my own humoring. Uh, but, of course, I didn't yank my arm away because he could have killed me right there and then. Mm. You, have to, you, you really have to size up the situation and the emotions that you choose. Mm. Uh, you, no one can really make you feel anything. And that's what's called today codependency. Codependency is really immaturity when you allow someone else to be responsible for your feeling. You made me angry. You may, mm. you know, men tell me many times, Edie, I hate you because you made me cry. And I said, I don't have such powers. I just brought some feelings out in you that's been there all along. There's a good word for it called trigger. People trigger feelings in you that has nothing to do with what's going on now. It has, it triggers some feelings that is unresolved grief uh, that you have in you from your childhood. Well, and you write about Dr. Mengele, the angel of death, who is a seasoned killer who's sending people to the gas changer. And you write, you say that you realize that he was more pitiful than you, that I'm free in my mind, which he can never be. He will always have to live with what he's done. He's more a prisoner than I am. And you say that you pray for him, for his sake. You pray for him. Well, I did. I ended up really doing that because I was able to turn hatred into pity. I felt so sorry for him wearing that uniform and throwing children to the gas chamber. And so I was able to somehow not allow ever for them to touch my spirit. 
time and time again, it's it's this idea, which is a powerful idea that we can choose our emotions, we can choose our mindsets. And it truly is your yeah. choices that saved your life. And now you are sharing the gift of your story and of just mm-hmm. your your own wisdom with all of us. And it truly is transformative. So I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome so much, honey. God bless you. There was a time when Dr. Eager, we spoke about about this, when she returns back to Auschwitz, back to the place of her unthinkable and unspeakable tragedy and trauma. And last minute she says, I I just, I can't do it. I want to go home. And her husband says to her, you've been afraid before. Welcome it. Welcome it. My husband is reminding me of what I believe too. This is the work of healing. You deny what hurts, what you fear. You avoid it at all costs. Then you find a way to welcome and embrace what you're most afraid of. And then you can finally let it go. Many of us are in a time of going through extreme hardship. Um, As a small business owner, I'm definitely not immune and feeling acutely aware of a lot of the disappointments and the grieving that we're doing. And it's important that we don't skip over the grief and the loss, but that we really can name these things, these disappointments. And I hope that today called you into that, into that space of being able to name what you're afraid of, what you're disappointed by, what you need to grieve, because it's only then that we can truly let it go. Thank you so much for joining me in this series. Our next week, we are going to be with Catherine Wolf, who has overcome um, in a very tragic stroke. And she truly is a teacher of hope. And she's going to encourage you so much. So we're back. Tell your friends we're here. Go forward this podcast to your friends via email tag us on Instagram. We are here and you're not going to want to miss the next few episodes. Thanks for joining me on the Going Scared podcast today. The Going Scared podcast is produced by Eddie Kofoltz. Our music today is by Ellie Holcomb and I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared.